Well, hi there. This is a bear. And so is this. And so is this. And so is this. But this isn't. And uh, neither is this. And neither is this. Bears are carnivores, most closely related to pinnipeds, such as seals and sea lions, and possibly also to mesteloids, such as red pandas, raccoons, skunks, and weasels. Today, there are only eight total species of bears in three subfamilies within the family Ursidae. And you can probably name at least half of them. And I'd wager that you can pick a bear out of a lineup of similar mammals. This bear here, the panda bear, might be the only one that you feel uncomfortable including as a bear. And the reality is that the panda is the hagfish of bears. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then you'll probably enjoy our video about how you are the hagfish of reptiles. But the panda is the hagfish of extant bears. All of the other bears are more closely related to one another than they are to pandas. So pandas could be included as members of the bear family, or they could be excluded as the closest living relatives to the bears. But the family Ursidae, which is essentially synonymous with bear, currently includes the giant panda, Ileropoda melanoleuca. Though not the red panda, which is a mustelloid. If you'd like to see a video about all of the mustelloids in the future, uh, let me know in the comments. But giant pandas are bears. Even though their genus name means catfoot, Ileropoda. Melanoleuca means black and pale, so the species name is fairly self-explanatory. The one subspecies, the quinling panda, is not black at all. It's more of a light brown and white. Did you even know these existed? But generally speaking, the species name makes sense. But why catfoot? I genuinely don't know. But it is worth noting that they are the only bears with cat-like slit pupils instead of round pupils. Though it is honestly ridiculously hard to get a good enough look at the eye to notice this on your own. But their most common Chinese name means giant bear cat. And this is because the red panda is the bear cat. In fact, the red panda was the original panda as well. Panda coming from French and referring to the red panda, with the black and white bear being the giant panda. So calling it something with cat in the name makes some sense, but their feet are nothing like those of cats. Giant pandas, like all bears, but unlike cats, are plantigrade, placing weight on the whole of the foot and not just on the toes, like cats, which are digitigrade. Their claws are not retractable, like those of other bears, but again, unlike most cats, all cats other than cheetahs, as far as I know, have retractable claws. Cats also have 18 total toes, five per forelimb and four per hind limb. Giant pandas have, uh, well, more than that, at least 20. But their forelimbs each have kind of a bonus finger, a bony protrusion in addition to their five normal toes that acts like a thumb. And this greatly helps to aid them in handling bamboo, which is their main food. Giant pandas are the only herbivorous bears, though some animal protein may sneak into their diet. The same is true for well, cows and almost all herbivores. Who wouldn't scarf up a little bird if given the chance? But to make a long story short, I see nothing about their feet that would cause me to call this thing a cat foot. Though they have the second longest tail of any bear, which reminds me a bit of the tail of a bobcat. So I would accept cat eye, cat tail, or bear that is not any more closely related to the bear cat than any of the other bears. But Cat foot doesn't make much sense at all to me. Giant pandas are found in a very small range in the mountains of central China, and that's it. They can weigh between 150 and 350 pounds, 70 to 160 kilos, with males being larger than females, a trend we'll notice with a lot of the bears. And they can stand as much as six feet, about 1.9 meters tall, though they're only about half that height at the shoulder when they're on all fours. I'd just like to say, we would have a bear of a time producing content like this if it weren't for our supporters at Patreon. And so if you would like to see more videos like this in the future, or the extra videos that we have just for our patrons, please consider checking it out. The next most distantly related of all bears would be the South American spectacled bear. This is a bear that is easy to forget when taking inventory of all the bears that you can name. Unless you're a big fan of Paddington, who looks more like a baby brown bear or a cinnamon black bear, but coming from 
darkest Peru. He's got to be a spectacled bear. As the spectacled bear, Tremarctos ornatus is the only species of bear in South America. Tremarctos meaning whole bear for a diagnostic hole in their humerus, and ornatus meaning ornate or decorated. And this is probably the most ornate of all bears, except for the giant pandas. These markings on the face and chest of this bear is the reason that they are called spectacled bears, as the markings commonly encircle the eyes like spectacles. Though I seem to think of spectacles as being a bit more proper than these glasses, I would call them giant novelty glasses bear. Or Andean bears, another of their common names, since these bears are found in the Andean mountains of western South America. A place that holds a special place in my heart, as I used to live there as well, though I never saw a spectacled bear. The spectacled bears are the last remaining short-faced bears, a group of bears that includes what may have been the largest bear and the largest carnivorous land mammal ever. A giant short-faced bear that may have stood over 14 feet tall and weighed over 2 tons. For the record, that's almost twice the size of any modern bear. But its closest living relative, the spectacled bear, is only about a tenth of that size. Males stand, at most, a bit over six feet, about two meters tall. Only two or three feet tall at the shoulder, less than one meter. And they weigh, at most, a bit over 400 pounds. That's just a bit over 180 kilos. Some adult females are less than 100 pounds, about 35 kilos. Most spectacled bears are black or very dark brown with markings on their face and chest. Though light brown bears like Paddington do technically exist. As much as 95% of their diet may come from plants, and the majority of their time is spent up in the trees. The six remaining bears are all more closely related to one another than they are to pandas or spectacled bears, and all of them fall into the same subfamily, Ursinae. Of the members of the Ursinae, the most distantly related member is the sloth bear of India and Sri Lanka. Though sloth bear is a poor name in my estimation, I would call them the tamandua bear, because they're much more like an arboreal anteater than they are like a sloth. This is reflected to some degree in their species name, Molursus, meaning honey bear, though they're more likely to eat the actual bees than they are the honey. However, when sloth bears were first described, they were actually described as bear-like sloths, not sloth-like bears or really bears that are only vaguely like sloths, and they were placed into the sloth genus Bradypus. I still don't see it. Honey bear makes far more sense, but they do have long claws like sloths, so they use them to dig, not to climb. They can climb, but they're not nearly as good at it as many of their close relatives due to their long claws. They also lack their two front teeth on the top. That's, that's the main thing they have like sloths. Other than that, they're not much like sloths at all, and they're a heck of a lot like bears. Really fluffy bears, with the longest tails of any bear, generally wearing an Egyptian Yusek collar, with long, dexterous gorilla lips, and a huge nose, which are all very useful for sniffing out and sucking up ants and termites, their very favorite prey. Indian sloth bears are similar in size to spectacled bears, and the other subspecies, the Sri Lankan sloth bear, is even smaller and frequently lacks the collar. But sloth bears are the honey badgers of the Indian subcontinent. Well, I guess other than, you know, honey badgers, which are, are there too. But sloth bears, though they may be smallish and not really hunt large prey, they do sometimes need to fight tigers. So they have massive canine teeth in addition to their huge claws and are notoriously cantankerous. Rumor has it that the only animals that they fear are chuckwallas but probably take that with a grain of salt. The remaining bears fall into two clades. One clade containing the biggest, most man-eatingest bears alive today, and the other containing the three bears that you might confuse with a sloth bear. So I'll start there. Of these three bears, the least closely related member to the other two is the sun bear. If you're ever in Southeast Asia and you spot a little shaved sloth bear up in a tree that looks to be a huge fan of Gene Simmons from Kiss, it's a sun bear! Sun bears have a very similar coloration to sloth bears, but that short fur should give you the first indication that they aren't sloth bears. Their genus name, Helarctos, means sun bear. 
The chest marking is the source of this name. Sun bears are the smallest of all bears, weighing between 55 and 145 pounds, around 25 to 65 kilograms, and only standing four to five feet tall, around a meter and a half, and only about half that tall at the shoulder. And this is for the Malayan subspecies. The Bornean subspecies is even smaller still. In addition to their short coat, they can be identified by their inward-facing front feet that facilitate climbing. This is the most arboreal of all the bears. If you're going to be the smallest bear in the world, and you're going to live where there are tigers, you need to hide. Hi. A high hide. You know, you go up and you hide. Hide. And what do they eat up there? Basically all of the same things you would eat if you were trying to survive in the rainforest. Fruits, seeds, vegetables, birds, deer, honey, insects, whatever they can get, basically, while trying to avoid tigers. The two closest relatives to the sun bear are the two species of black bears, the Asian and the American. Since we're in Asia already, and we're discussing bears that look like sloth bears, let's start with the Asian black bear. There are seven subspecies of Asian black bears, and they are found all over southern Asia except on the Indian subcontinent. Almost like they were avoiding the sloth bears. And fair enough, because if there was ever a bear that you were going to confuse with a sloth bear, it's an Asian black bear. And they're about the same size as sloth bears. They have the chest spot like sloth bears. They are the same color generally. And they're fluffy as heck. Though they do seem to be a bit more groomed. They don't look as much like an old gorilla costume as sloth bears do. And their face looks more like that of an American black bear. It doesn't have the big nose and gorilla lips of the sloth bear. Nor does it have the big white claws of the sloth bear. It has shorter dark claws for climbing. More like those of the sun bear. But they're much bigger and far fluffier than sun bears. And are actually sometimes called moon bears. But for the same reason that sun bears are called sun bears. Because of their chest marking. Which apparently is more moon-like on Asian black bears than it is on sun bears. But the closest relatives of Asian black bears aren't sun bears or sloth bears, but rather the generally colorless American black bears. Though some do have that color. The easiest way to distinguish between an American black bear and an Asian black bear is by knowing which continent you're on. But if you don't know, American black bears are a bit bigger, weighing as much as 550 pounds, 250 kilos, and standing two meters tall, over six and a half feet. This makes them the third largest bears on Earth, behind only the last two that we have to discuss. So they are bigger than Asian black bears. They're also usually not as fluffy, and generally lack the chest markings common on the Asian black bear. American black bears are generally black, but they also come in a wide variety of other colors, including cinnamon brown and white, meaning that they are sometimes mistaken for brown bears and polar bears, which are also both present in North America. And there are as many as 16 distinct subspecies of American black bears. Of these, the cinnamon bear of Colorado, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Washington, Oregon, and Utah is the most likely to be brown. Well over half are brown. In some places, over 90% are brown. And the Kermode bear of British Columbia is the most likely to be white. These white bears are also known as spirit bears, though only about 10% of the Kermode population is actually white. And these black bears are the only bears in North America that you are likely to confuse with the two bears in the one remaining clade of bears. These are the polar bears and the brown bears, which are both found in North America and Asia. Because despite the way that it looks on most maps, Asia and North America, well, they're neighbors. The Alaskan and Russian mainlands are only 55 miles apart. That's less than 90 kilometers. And during the last glacial maximum, it was not difficult at all to walk from one to the other. So polar bears and brown bears are found on both continents. And while the two subspecies of brown bears from North America seem to get the most attention, their range across Asia and Europe is far more expansive and diverse, as are the bears themselves. Dozens of brown bear subspecies have been proposed, but today something like eight are commonly recognized. All within the species Ursus arctos, which really shows just how ubiquitous brown bears are. Ursus is bear in Latin. Arctos is bear in Greek. It's the bear bear. Brown bears in North America can be distinguished from black bears, such as the cinnamon bear, by their size, large claws, and distinctive shoulder hump. 
That said, brown bears, being so widely distributed, are the most variably sized of all bears. Females of some subspecies can get down to weights similar to sun bears, which we know are the smallest of all bears. And the Kodiak subspecies can rival the largest bears on Earth, the polar bear, for size coming in at as much as 1,500 pounds, 680 kilos. Typical size for a brown bear is somewhere between 180 and 1,320 pounds, 80 to 600 kilos. As is the case generally for bears, it is the males that are larger. Of course, with brown bears, females of some populations are larger than males of others. They tend to stand from under 5 to over 9 feet tall, 1.4 to 2.8 meters, and under 2.5 to about 5 feet at the shoulder. That's 0.7 to 1.5 meters. And again, that shoulder is capped with a large and distinctive hump, which distinguishes brown bears from any other, including polar bears, as brown bears are sometimes white or very nearly white and similar in size to polar bears, even with overlapping ranges. In Asia, some populations often sport the Egyptian Yusuk collar, you know, the one that basically all of the Asian bears have. But the Asian bears are not all one another's closest relatives. So it's unlikely that they all have this collar because the common ancestor of all of the Asian bears was into Egyptian fashion. The leading hypothesis as to why this coloration appears across the Asian bears seems to be tigers. Generally speaking, an animal would need to be crazy to deliberately engage in a fight with a bear, unless that animal is a tiger. There are tigers that even specialize on bears. But even a tiger would need to be crazy to take on a bear head on. And tigers tend to back down when confronted face to face with a bear. So it appears that bears, like bees and wasps, have developed aposematic warning colors to indicate clearly to tigers that you are coming head on. Because while tigers prefer not to attack bears from the front, that doesn't help the bear if the tiger can't tell that that is your front. Fighting a tiger is a bad deal even if you win. And again, like bees and wasps, the aposematic signal has been stronger and more effective because all of the bears, even though they're not that closely related, have converged on a very similar signal. And while tigers do hunt and kill brown bears from time to time, Bigger brown bears also sniff out tigers that have made fresh kills, run off the tiger, and steal their kills. In other places, they do this to predators like wolves. If you want to know how I think that tyrannosaurs made a living, take a long, hard look at brown bears. And if you want to know as much about tyrannosaurs as you now know about bears, you're really going to enjoy our video about all of the tyrannosaurids. But before you can go there, we need to check out the final and largest bear, the only hypercarnivorous bear, and the largest land predator currently on Earth, the polar bear. Hypercarnivorous, by the way, just means that more than 70% of its diet comes from meat. Polar bears are often classified as marine mammals because they spend so much of their lives out on sea ice. Hence their scientific name, Ursus meridimus, the maritime bear. This is a difficult place to be a vegan. As a result, more than 90% of the polar bear diet may be meat, while many of their closest relatives, the brown bears, consume less than 10% meat. And the bulk of that polar bear meat comes from seals, though they also eat whales like belugas, birds, eggs, and whatever sources of meat make themselves too accessible to pass up. Being so closely related to brown bears and having ranges that overlap, hybrid growler bears do exist. I'd love to know how much meat they tend to eat. Closer to 10% or closer to 90%? Polar bears are, on average, the largest of all bears at 330 to 1,500 pounds. That's 150 to 700 kilos, with males being roughly twice the size of females. Though individual Kodiak bears do get bigger than most polar bears, they are, on average, not as large as polar bears. Additionally, the largest polar bear on record weighed in at 2,209 pounds. That's over a metric ton. That was in the wild. That is slightly bigger than the largest Kodiak on record that weighed a measly 2,130 pounds, which is about 26 kilos short of a ton. Though this was a captive bear and there are reports that it had been heavier at one point in time. So it is possible that the largest bear in the recent past, at least by mass, was a Kodiak. That said, on average, 
polar bears just edge them out for size. But I really wouldn't recommend fighting either of them, Tiger. That giant polar bear, by the way, it stood over 11 feet tall. Though the typical height for a polar bear is between somewhere around 6 feet and almost 10 feet. That's 1.8 to 3 meters, and just over half of that at the shoulder. Polar bears may be the longest of all bears, but they have the most proportionally short tails and really small ears. Their heads are longer than those of brown bears, but not nearly as wide. And that head shape, along with the hump of brown bears, is probably the best way to distinguish between the two. And that concludes our tour of all of the bears. Now, I should mention that only two of these bear species are doing really well in the wild, the American black bear and brown bears, though not every subspecies. And the biggest threat to all of the others is habitat loss and fragmentation. If you want to save wild things, save wild places. As always, like and subscribe, and we hope to see you real soon. Which bear is best? <laughs> there are two schools of thought on this. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> black bear. No, what did you say? Polar bear? I don't know. I think you're right. Bears black bear. eat beets. <laughs> bears. Bears. Beets. Beets. Battle Star Galactica. <laughs> Identity theft is not a joke, Jim. <laughs>